Hello, and thank you very much for coming along once again this evening. This evening we're going to take up on the themes that we began last week, namely the enduring legacies of colonialism. There are a number of them, and they can be listed fairly easily, although their implications are hard to work out sometimes. So we're going to discuss them a bit, but the whole point is that we live in a world that's in some sense post-colonial, although some would argue it's neo-colonial and never got to the stage of being post-colonial. It's just swapped, in a sense, the colonial powers that dominate the system. But in any case, we ought to pay attention to the metaphors that came into existence during this 500-year period since Columbus, about 1492 until the late 1990s and to our present day. Basically, it's 400, I mean 525 years now, um, basically, until uh, we look back at this whole colonial period. And there's a whole bunch of metaphors that were adopted, assumed, written into policy, and came to dominate the outlook of a whole series of countries and even cultures. And those metaphors, images, policies are problematic in the post-colonial world. In fact, in the modern world more generally. So we're going to look at um, this whole question of overcoming the multiple legacies of European colonialism. As I said, we started last week, but we're going to look at some enduring myths that now animate the world after 500 years of European colonialism. They can be listed pretty quickly, even though their implications are wide-reaching. First, the myth of racial and or cultural or religious exceptionalism. This can be uh, shorthanded as racism or Christian dominance or uh, Western assumptions of dominance. Uh, these are cultural, religious, and sometimes they're racialized as well um, in such a way that these categories, either religious groups, cultural groups, or racial groups, are thought to be exceptions to the general pattern of the whole world's existence. And that exceptional status enables those who hold that status to think that they're entitled to do various things because they are white, or they are Muslim, or they are Hindu, or they are, in fact, Chinese. The exceptionalism is by no means limited to Western white colonial powers. But it has to be recognized that it became very prominent during the period of 1492 to the present because of the domination of European maritime colonialism over the rest of the world. The second can be called the frontier myth and the ensuing illusion of economies of perpetual growth, as if economies can grow forever, and of course they should, if they can, right? Well, that's a huge myth, and one that got going during the colonial period, and has never been abandoned. In fact, it's become embraced, even off the planet, as we'll see. People are talking about frontiers of space, as if that has any meaning whatsoever. Finally, a third category can be looked at the myth of techno-scientific salvationism. This is the myth that, thanks to science, we are no longer subject to nature. We have, in some sense, conquered not only other territories, not only other peoples, but nature itself. And our technology and our scientific understanding will bring about our collective salvation uh, not just any longer as a particular racial group, or a particular ethnic group, or a particular religious group, but as humanity as a whole. This is the myth of techno-scientific salvationism, launched during the high moments 
of Western science coming out of imperialism, but by no means abandoned. In fact, it's become extended all around the world at this point. So let's look first at the myth of racial or cultural or religious exceptionalism, the idea that some cultures are set apart and superior to others. Well, this has been uh, challenged and there are <coughs> alternative narrows, uh, narratives now out there that are coming into focus. Uh, instead of looking at the 1620 narrative and the pilgrims and the landing in the New World, people are starting to look at the African Americans who were sold into slavery and showed up in fact in 1619 in Virginia. And here in Boston we had, as I mentioned last week, <coughs> a marking of these events and a in a sense, a celebration of the legacy of 1619. In fact, it's a nationwide project, and you ought to look into it. It's called the 1619 Project, and it's trying to rectify some fundamental misunderstandings about American history that we all seem to uh, have inherited if we went through the school system in the United States. People like Henry Louis Gates have brought to our attention that we all really ought to recall some aspects of America's immigration policies over the years, especially in Black History Month, but in general, <laughs> from now on in, we ought to recognize that <clears throat> we're the beneficiaries of the largest non-voluntary migration in human history, known as the slave trade, and it made a huge impact on the development of the Western Hemisphere, not just the West Indies, or South America, or Brazil, where most of the slaves were imported, but in fact, as part of the Columbian exchange. It turns out now, as we look more at the biology of that exchange, with people like Alfred Crosby's book, uh, a subtitle, The Biological and Cultural Consequences of 1492, that the Columbian exchange was really rather complex and it included a lot of things, plants and animals. He went on to write another book called Ecological Imperialism, looking at the biological expansion of Europe and it really was triggered in the slave trade period by the collapse of the indigenous population and the necessity, according to the European settlers, of importing labor that could no longer be provided locally because populations were dying of diseases and malnutrition because of the introduction of very strange animals by the Europeans who competed with them for the food supply. We need to remember that through the 18th century, right through the period of American uh, War of Independence, Revolutionary War we called it, it wasn't very revolutionary, but it was basically a war of white settlers trying to gain control over an economy which was largely energized, the energy was provided by slaves. There's no question about that. And in fact in our era, that's what some of the people recalling this history want to underscore. The wealth of America came out of this period from the work of slaves. But beyond the myth of racism, which attributed the emergence of America largely to white settlers <laughs> and white achievements, um, clearly falsified by the record, there is the problem of an ever-expanding frontier, and in a sense, Columbus gave rise to his whole set of myths about this. Take a look. Columbus, in a sense, introduced the biggest misplaced metaphor in history. He got to the New World, let's call it that, Agellan after him, shortly thereafter, and went around the whole shooting match, you know, and pretty much proved that it's round. But Columbus and everyone who came after him unleashed the biggest chapter in linear thinking in human history, the frontier. Endless frontiers, movement out into space in a linear inclined plane. This is progress. This is out there to conquer. Of course, we disregarded the populations that lived on the other side of the frontier. They, they didn't count. White settler frontierism is at the core of the colonial mistake. And unless we can transcend that form of linear thinking, and I don't think it's going to be easy. I mean, in the United States, even our greatest cultural heroes like John Kennedy elected 
his constituency and he mobilized them on the basis of frontiers of space. Well, there's nothing more absurd than the idea of frontiers of a sphere, right? Uh, where you, how are you going to draw it? It's, it's a linear metaphor off of a sphere. Can't happen, won't happen. Fast, you've got to overcome this notion of continuous growth, got to overcome the notion of anthropocentricity, or the silly word for saying we're the cause and purpose of the universe. Not so. And you've got to start learning to take notes from the margins on cultures here, cultures there, and guess what? Species elsewhere. Just take the case of agriculture. Humans don't produce food. We can't produce food. The best you and I can do if we go out in the sunlight is get a suntan. And if we stay out there too long, we'll get sunstroke. But we don't photosynthesize. We depend on other organisms that do photosynthesize. Right? There's a ratio between the green leaf and the human population. As I say, anybody who thinks that humans can infinitely expand has no idea about how an ecosystem functions. In an ecosystem, all you can do, your best role as a human species, is to learn how to favor the environment for plants to grow. In other words, you can produce topsoil, topsoil produces food. And if you're lucky, you can get enough of that back to you to keep going. But if you're not producing topsoil, if in fact you're doing what every country, in every continent, in every culture is doing at this point, destroying topsoil, you're on the wrong side of the evolutionary trip here. <laughs> and your journey won't be long. Right. Your journey won't be long if you still adhere to the frontier metaphor because there are no frontiers in an ecosystem. This was pointed out years ago in an article called Rubbish and Racism, emphasizing that we had fed the heart on fantasies. The heart's grown brutal from the fair. A quote from W.B. Yeats and his meditations in time of civil war. Having expanded upon the things of nature, modern mankind has come to believe that expansion is in the nature of things. This is not so, of course, but we are only now just beginning to discover that this cherished belief is a potentially fatal illusion. You can't infinitely expand on a finite planet. Even though human expansion has been pretty impressive in the last several hundred years, especially since 1492. Never before and never again in human history will that happen. Now it happened largely because of the activities and investment, personal investment and hard work of Norman Borlaug, the father of the Green Revolution. He's referred to by one author as the wizard in a dual study of two remarkable scientists and their dueling visions to shape the world tomorrow's world. He's the wizard, but not the prophet. The prophet indicated this wouldn't be possible. William Vogt. Take a look at it. Norman Borlaug said he could increase the production of agriculture. How? Well, basically by mechanizing it and motorizing it. See the tractor? Well, the tractor, in effect, is substituted for human labor. And humanity transformed agriculture from a solar-based system to a global petro-dependent one in a very short period of time. Trouble is, this may prove to have been a mistake, a big mistake. Why? Well, because you're subordinating your primary production system to a non-renewable. If we are ethically responsible for the foreseeable consequences of our own behavior, what will this mean for the ethics of agriculture? Norman Borlaug addressed the food problem, but we've come to understand that this is only part of a food population problem. If you expand the food supply, you're going to expand the population. And that, in turn, is only part of a bigger problem, food population environment problem. So, to address this larger issue 
food population environment, we're going to have to undergo a paradigm shift, a shift in fundamental metaphors that drive our culture. Because as the Indian critique of petro-intensive agriculture is made clear, we can't survive unless ultimately we base our production on soil, not oil. Soil, not oil, has been the message of Vandana Shiva for the last 40 years. It's very clear that it's now up against the ecological limits. Also underscored by the world's leading naturalist, you've seen David Attenborough, and you've come to be aware that he has said the greatest threat to humanity in thousands of years is climate change. The use of petrointensive agriculture is aggravating climate change, making it worse. Now, information about this has been available for 30 years. In fact, <clears throat> Jim Hansen pointed this out in 1988 in June, and by September of that year, the socioeconomic implications of that were outlined in two rather lengthy testimonies to the United States Senate. The question became one of stability versus overshoot. And as we now realize, the food gap is growing, especially since we haven't addressed the climate issue. The demand for climate justice is going to be looking like a food justice question. Road scholars have warned of the dramatic transformations that are going to be needed in the next few years, but the responsibilities of those causing the problem have not been fully appreciated and recognized. Take a look. Here in Copenhagen, the U.S. has rejected calls for the payment of climate reparations to poorer countries for the devastation wrought by global warming. Reparations advocates say the U.S. and other industrialized nations owe a debt to poorer countries for the effects of decades of emissions. On Wednesday, the lead U.S. negotiator, Todd Stern, said he categorically rejects the principle of climate debt. We absolutely recognize our historic role in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, putting the emissions in the atmosphere up there that are, you know, that are there now, but, but the sense of guilt or culpability or reparations, I, I just com I categorically reject that. Now, this is pretty extraordinary. We recognize the role, he says. We recognize our role, but we reject any responsibility for it. It's unbelievable. We absolutely recognize our historic role in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, putting the emissions in the atmosphere up there that are, you know, that are there now, but, but the sense of guilt or culpability or reparations, I, I just com I categorically reject that. Well, he may categorically reject it, but the United States is being categorically rejected for this kind of arrogance. And it's based more deeply on an arrogance of humanism, of thinking that humans are at the center of an ecosystem. Fortunately, <clears throat> there's going to be a forum on these questions in Oxford uh, called the Inaugural Roads Forum, Humanities Forum, um, looking at narratives of change because we need desperately to develop new narratives of change. And this is now coming up, in fact, in November, <clears throat> November 16th and 17th in Oxford. Get over there, listen to it, get hold of the recordings from it if you can. It'll be a very interesting narrative that has to change very quickly because Cecil Rhodes was known, among other things, for having pushed the limits of colonialism, preached the advantage of technology. Here he's shown with a, uh, a telegraph from Cape to Cairo and championed the notion of more, bigger, better with extractionist economies. Well, we need to transcend the institutions we inherit and create, and the Rhodes Scholars are beginning to look at that, especially in the era of climate change and the Anthropocene in which we now live. They like the slogan, fighting the world's fight, but they've got to confront the issue, basically, what is the world's fight in the Anthropocene? What role is Rhodes and his legacy going to have in confronting the world's fight? Well, the world's fight's pretty clear if you listen to some. Take a look.
We're a fossil fuel dependent civilization, independent of what nationality we are. Our modern civilization is dependent on fossil fuels. We have to get to being a solar sustainable system. You know, a bit. There's a bit of a transition, right? Transition studies are what's now in, in every discipline, every department, every university. Right. And this is why there are road scholars <laughs> for transition studies at this point. And in fact, we're going to have to look very carefully at this whole question of what can be sustainable. Oxford might try to do it with its own degree programs. Take a look. So, advice? <clears throat> I had a plan a while back for PP&E at Oxford. They have a philosophy, um, politics, and economics degree here, which they're very proud of. It's absolutely misfocused. It should be physics, philosophy, and ecosystem science. PPE, but physics, philosophy, and ecosystem science. Why? To learn that we're not the center of a complex ecosystem, and to learn how to use all the physics we can muster, and all the philosophy we can manage to, to uh, absorb, to realize that we, as a part of a functioning ecosystem, we've got to learn how to be a participant, not a dominant uh, species. So you got a, a new PPE degree, you invent it. Tell them they should give you a <laughs> diploma for it, because they don't so far. In fact, they're giving out these PPE degrees for people who think they're in charge. The growth economics is the answer. It's the biggest mistake in human history. Good luck. Well, they've been the discussions from the voices of Oxford, but it's not clear they're getting out beyond that. We're going to be looking at this new inaugural Rhodes Humanities Forum in November to see if it leads any way out of our current dilemma, or whether it just, in fact, in fighting the world's fight, fights for more, bigger, better logic of human domination. Not clear, not clear, especially from the Rhodes tradition itself, raising the question, can humanity survive the Anthropocene? And can Oxford help? Can Yale, can Harvard, can any one of these institutions help, built as they are, upon promoting uh, human enterprises? Question is, quite simply, can humanity survive the arrogance of the Anthropocene? Not clear we can. There are efforts, obviously, to look at this again and again and get the word out that infinite growth on a finite planet is not possible and we will look forward to the new narratives of change that will be coming from that conference. Because we're all migrants now on a burning planet, we need to take a long-term view of the short-sightedness we're up against. Fossil fuel driven climate change will limit global food production, increase mass migration and threaten the survival of civilization. Yet we thought that fossil fuel agricultural production was in fact the big techno-scientific fix for the population problem. That's what Borlaug thought. That's what he convinced a lot of people in the world about. And in fact we've reduced the number of farmers in America to less than one percent of the total population. Everything else is handled by petro-intensive agribusiness and we're in trouble. Not just because we're running scarce on the inputs, the petroleum, but because we can't survive the outputs, the burden of greenhouse gases pumped into the atmosphere as a result of changing from a solar sustainable system to a petro-intensive one. We need to be overcoming the multiple legacies of European colonialism, the frontier myth and the myth of techno-scientific salvationism are the ones that are driving human societies well beyond European colonialism. Perhaps the most convincing 
arguments now for either one of these things, frontiers of space and the myth of techno-scientific salvationism are coming from India and China, not from the West. We need to move towards a net zero logic, but to do this we need to act, act very fast to realize we're a human community.